Hello, my name is Nikki Richardson, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending tonight's presentation. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan SAB-sponsored pr program every semester. Members of the SAB get plenty of opportunities to network with our special guests. If you're a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. Furthermore, we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones and pagers. After the interview, we'll have some time for questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait patiently, and a student helper will be over to you to give you a microphone. And we also ask that you keep the questions brief. And now I'd like to introduce our director, Bill Lacey. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Nikki. Very nice job. We appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Our program is a little bit early, and uh, we're going to try to get concluded so all of you can get home in time to see the bulk of the basketball game on, on TV tonight. A uh, couple of notes about upcoming programs. We're doing our study groups, both Democratic and Republican fellows, running wonderful study groups this semester. Those are Tuesday and Wednesday at 4. You can read more about all of our upcoming programs on uh, the back of your program tonight. Our SAB program, Nikki mentioned our SAB programming that we do. Uh, we will have a program on hydraulic fracturing, uh, also called fracking, an environmental issue, on March 5th at 7.30. And in the next couple days, we'll be announcing our Dole Lecture for this spring, which will be on April 4, and it's gonna be a real big one, and you're all gonna wanna be here, so, uh, so stand by for that announcement. Now our guest tonight will be interviewed by Associate Director Barbara Ballard. You probably know Barbara and who she is, but you may not be aware of this. In addition to her role here at KU and in the State House, Representative Ballard is the National President of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. Uh, it's really a remarkable achievement, and so we're delighted that she can do the interview tonight. So uh, Barbara and I actually have been trying to get our guest here for some time. We're so delighted to have him here. Uh, and we actually both wanted to do the interview and we had this really vicious fight and you saw who won. <laughs> so so uh, anyway, she gets to do it tonight. Um, our guest tonight is somebody, as I say, that uh, we have wanted to host for quite some time. When I first moved to the area in uh, 1996, um, I was really impressed um, by Mayor Cleaver and the job he was do doing in Kansas City. And I was, I was new, and I think most everybody knows I'm a Republican, uh, but I just, I was very impressed. Every time I saw him on TV, he always, he was always passionate about issues, but he always spoke in measured tones, and he was always emphasized the necessity for being civil and, and thoughtful and everything. And, and um, uh, I've really uh, admired him and followed his career. And as all of you know, he now serves in the, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives. I got to meet the congressman first just a few months ago when both of us uh, did a panel in Kansas City on civility. And uh, we hit it off right away. And uh, of course, I couldn't resist immediately saying, well, congressman, we'd love to have you come out to KU, to the Dole Institute. And he agreed, and we worked out tonight, so we're very appreciative of that. I'm not going to review his detailed biography that's on your program tonight, but I do want to say he's one of America's most prominent political leaders. He serves as chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, established in 1971. Uh, less known is the fact that Congressman Cleaver is also uh, created and, and founded the Civility Caucus in Congress, uh, which hopefully he'll be ha uh, have an opportunity to talk about tonight. And today, he was just named national co-chair of the president's re-election campaign. So it's terrific to have uh, him here tonight. Uh, it is wonderful to be able to host him. And he will be interviewed by Barbara Ballard. But please welcome to the University of Kansas and the Dole Institute of Politics, Congressman Emanuel Cleaver. Thank you, Bill. We are delighted to have Congressman Cleaver with us this evening. Often we'll sit down and talk about who we should have as speakers, and actually it was Bill that said, you know, I'd like to have Congressman Cleaver. And I said, gee, I know him. And 
the two of us worked on it, and we're just delighted that he was here, uh, that he is here this evening. I told Congressman Cleaver, we're going to have a conversation, and you're going to have the privilege of eavesdropping in on it. And so then you'll have your time to ask questions as well. So I'm going to try to keep it very informal, but I would like to uh, provide the opportunity for you to know more about Congressman Cleaver, why he thinks what he does, and how all of this came about. Because I think it's very unique from his background to where he is today. Now, you know, February is Black History Month. And the first question I'm going to ask him is, why is black history important? Every, every, uh, everybody's history is important. Every group uh, has a, a history that is important. And history helps shape our um, racial somebodiness. And if our history, if we've been emasculated of our history, it reduces our somebodiness because it doesn't give us a, feel, a complete picture of who we are. And people always want to build up their history, uh, even, even if it is not completely uh, accurate. Uh, for example, uh, most of the people here uh, who've not been to Israel, uh, you've read uh, in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition uh, about the Jordan River. And uh, you probably have in your mind this majestic river flowing like uh, the Missouri. Uh, the truth of the matter is, in some parts, you can hop over the Jordan stream, um, but uh, uh, the, the Jews of old uh, wrote of it as, a, as this majestic body. We, we, for example, we talk about the Sea of Galilee. There is no Sea of Galilee. There's a large lake uh, that the, uh, the, 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 the Israelites, uh, Hebrews, chose to call it you know, a sea. It, it, it would not even measure up alongside any of the Great Lakes. Uh, so, but it's all about building uh, one's history. And uh, the history of African Americans is as important as anybody else's history. And uh, if we could back out the history of African America, uh, of African Americans, it would reduce the history of America. And uh, there are probably things that are the people in here now. We don't have time to, do, to talk about it tonight. That African Americans did that they would never have even imagined. Uh, I heard on a talk radio show. Radio show um, about a year ago, it almost threw up, uh, some guy saying, well, um, you know, African Americans have made no contr uh, contributions to, to uh, civilization, uh, you know, and, and uh, they are, you know, essentially sponges just sponging up. Uh, and it bothered me only because, I mean, the, the ignorance didn't bother me, that it was the fact that uh, we have not bothered to produce black history in our textbooks, uh, and it's only dealt with during uh, 28 days of February, uh, or leap year, 29. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start with his early life, but I wanted to just set the stage for why he thinks black history is important. I want you to tell us about your early life, where you were born, where you came from, a little about your mom and dad, and set the stage for where you were born. I was born in uh, Waxahachie, Texas, W-A-X-A-H-A-C-H-I-E, um, which is about a 35-minute drive to downtown Dallas. Um, my family, uh, my family lived there. Um, it's a weird story. Um, my uh, my grandpa, my great grandpa, but. He lived until I was uh, uh, in college, um, and, and, and he was my grandpa, because uh, I, I never, um, I, that's a longer story, but my, my, my grandpa was white, and he uh, saw a um, young black woman up in a tree, 15 years old. He was 21. Um, uh, she wouldn't come down. He rode by every day, talked to her up in the tree. Finally, he had the nerve to ask if he could come sit on the porch, and her parents said he could sit on the porch and talk with her. 
Uh, to reduce the story's length, uh, they got married and had 18 children. Uh, one of them was Annie Mae uh, Barton, and uh, she had uh, three sons, uh, um, Leroy, LG, and Emmanuel. And um, LG was my father. Uh, in, in those days, many black parents would not give their, pa their children uh, full names because uh, whites would never call blacks by their uh, last name. So for, uh, a guy was in my office today uh, uh, who some of the, uh, the people probably uh, have heard of. Uh, he, he's a, used to, well, he still is a, is a uh, somewhat of a, a comedian, but uh, uh, his name is Dick Gregory. And uh, Dick Gregory uh, named his oldest son Mr. Uh, so, and so <clears throat> uh, many people had, the blacks in that day, they would name their kids uh, with an alphabet. So my father was uh, L.G. That's his birth uh, name. And um, when he was drafted, the army forced him to put a name to it. They said, we can't you know, draft a, an alphabet. So uh, he said, I'm Lucky. <laughs> so that became his name, uh, Lucky Cleaver. Um, and then uh, on, on my uh, paternal side, but on the Cleaver side, my uh, great-great-grandpa, uh, Frank Harrison Cleaver um, had nine children, and uh, one of them was Leroy Cleaver Sr. And uh, he um, married Annie Mae Barton, and that created the opportunity for me. Uh, um, my father was born, and I was named after his youngest brother. And then uh, my mother, uh, we, we know very little about her family. Um, uh, I only know one person on my mother's uh, side, and um, so uh, we we uh, we lived in a shack. I didn't live in a house with running water or electricity uh, or indoor plumbing until I was seven. Uh, we we had a uh, we had a uh, outhouse about fifty or sixty yards down a hill. And my mother, three sisters, and father lived in a two-room shack. Uh, and then we uh, moved to uh, uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, and we moved into public housing. So we, we lived into public housing, which also gives me, uh, uh, in, in many instances, uh, a great pain because when I hear people talking about poor people and some of the things they say, and don't know poor people, never been around poor people, it, it bothers me. Uh, so my father eventually, uh, working three jobs, I might add, <clears throat> uh, was able to um, buy a house in the white neighborhood, but because we couldn't live there, he had it moved uh, uh, from a strip sh across the street from a strip shopping mall uh, to the black neighborhood. And uh, he lives in that house today. Uh, uh, and, and so we had our own home. Uh, and and my, my father uh, insisted that my mother go to college. So when I was in the eighth grade, my mother started college. And I have uh, three sisters, um, all three college graduates, uh, one with a doctorate. Um, and. Um, I, I'm often thinking about if somebody had seen us sitting on the porch at uh, 402B Bailey in the public housing, and they'd see the four kids sitting over there, they'd say, oh, those girls are never finished, they're going to get pregnant, and the boy will probably end up dead and uh, so forth. So there, there are eight Cleaver kids my three sisters and me, and then my father's oldest brother has three girls and a boy. We live about five blocks apart. We grew up almost like, and we all look alike, so we could, you know, uh, be, be sisters. 
all of us have college degrees. And, and, and uh, we, we picked cotton, we picked peaches, pecans, uh, did everything. And uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to, to play football a little. So I lightened the load because I was able to get a football scholarship. Um, went to Murray State. There were some real bad racial problems. All the black players left after uh, my freshman year, and I went to Prairie View and graduated from, from Prairie View. And that segues right into my next question. Prairie View is a historical black college. How did that prepare you for public service? It was amazing. It's a Cleaver school. We, I think we've had about 13 Cleavers to graduate from, from Prairie View. Uh, I just did the alumni uh, uh, annual luncheon two Saturdays ago. But here's, here's the, the, the beauty of the HBCU, and it removes all excuses. First of all, I either make the football team uh, because I'm good enough uh, or because I am able to conjure enough energy, energy to impress the coach. So I'm not worried about whether or not I'm going to make the, the team based on my race uh, or that I will be kicked off because of my race. I don't have to worry about whether or not I can be the president of the student body. Uh, I don't have to worry about uh, I, I was vice president of our, my junior class, uh, president of my fraternity, all those things. It, it does two things, both of them are positive. One, it eliminates any, any excuse. You go to HBCU, you gotta come up with another excuse. You gotta say, you know, uh, people were putting something in my water at night um, <laughs> or something. Uh, but, you know, there's no, uh, it, there's no problem of, of race. The other is it, it provides you with opportunities for leadership that you would not have at another school. Uh, so uh, you look at the people who went to HBCUs, and uh, you know up until now, uh, they're the people who end up in positions of leadership, whether it's Martin Luther King at Morehouse, or uh, Jesse Lewis Jackson uh, at South Carolina State, or John Lewis at Fisk, I'm sorry, at uh, Tennessee State. Uh, or, or we just go on and on and on and on. So it, it, ha it allows you to, to develop leadership. Uh, now, uh, there's some negatives too, and that is that that's not the world you're gonna go into mm -hmm. after graduation. Uh, but uh, if, 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 uh, the if, if uh, the leadership skills are acquired uh, at, a, at a very sophisticated level, it will still work uh, in the multiracial society that we, we all live in. Okay. You lived during the time of Martin Luther King, and a lot of people probably in our audience this evening uh, have, did not have that honor. What influence did Dr. Martin Luther King have on you? He had tremendous influence over me. Uh, my mother also did. Uh, my whole family, I, my family lives a long time. Uh, you know, my, my great-grandpa, uh, my great grand, my great great grandfather Frank Harrison Cleaver, died when I was 12. My great great grandfather. Uh, my great grandfather, Noah, the Reverend Noah Albert Cleaver, uh, set my twins on his knee at age 100 and recited Waterloo. Uh, so, the 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 the, the, the longevity you know, has, has always been a, a factor, um, you know, in, in, in my uh, life. But the, the, I think it's important, to me it's at least, uh, is important uh, to, to benefit from your, your, uh, your, your family, uh, the, the richness uh, that we all have from, from our families. And I think I was, was fortunate enough to, to um, to, to, to benefit, uh, you know, from them. Uh, I'm not sure that I can pinpoint, uh, you know, any uh, particular thing, uh, but Martin Luther King uh, influenced my mother 
and, and I can, and I'll never forget, my mother walks into a grocery store, I mean, I'm sorry, a drugstore, and sits down at the counter uh, near Wichita Falls General Hospital. And they, of course, came over. She ordered a, a hamburger and a, and a cherry Coke and fries. Uh, they came over, gave it to her in a sack, and did, which is, was common. Everybody uh, knew, knew that was ha would happen. And she said, no, I'm going to sit at the counter. And they said, no, you're not going to sit at the counter. And she said, well, I don't want this. And they said, no, you, you've ordered it. So it, all, the whole thing probably cost 3 or $4. My mother then went and picked three or four dollars worth of merchandise out of the store and then walked outside to wait to be arrested. Um, uh, the, the, the proprietor was embarrassed and didn't, didn't call to get her uh, arrested. When I was 15 years old, when in, in Wichita Falls, we had three downtown movie theaters. Uh, and of course, blacks could not attend the movie theaters. And uh, so uh, when I was 15, uh, uh, this story was recently printed in a, in a, in a Texas newspaper. Um, I organized uh, about 100 crazy kids who would follow me. I'm 15. And we, we marched uh, to, to the, the movie theaters. We got in the line and all uh, put our 50 cents on the, in, uh, in front of the ticket uh, person. So we'd like to get a ticket. They said, we don't sell tickets to Negroes, and uh, they, that's not the term they use, but uh, we, 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 we marched around. Uh, we were turned down uh, pretty soon. Uh, uh, police and the uh, Texas Rangers and uh, Ren 1010, <laughs> Superman, all of, everybody was following us. There was one person following us on the other side of the street. It was Lucky Cleaver. And then I saw my father. I didn't know until years later, my mother told me, that he had a 38. Um, my father was not into the let him hit you and, uh, you know, we make a point. So um, <laughs> my, my, uh, my father um, uh, marched the whole distance on the other side of the street. Uh, this story appeared in the newspaper uh, um, on the eve of Pre President Obama's inauguration, they were interviewing a young a girl uh, who I think is in San Angelo, Texas. And she said <laughs> that uh, she remembered the march and she was about 12 and she asked me if I could march with her and I told her she was too little and she needed to get back in the house. Uh, I don't remember you know, that, that incident, but if a 12 year old uh, wanted to follow me uh, at age 15, she really was crazy. <laughs> and, um, w but the, the good news is nobody was injured, nobody was hurt. Yeah. And, and, and a thing that probably most people don't realize, uh, out of all the, 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 the um, murders during the 60s in the, s the civil rights, there was never anyone killed, not anyone, not one single person killed in a march with Martin Luther King. Uh, but he had enormous influence uh, over me uh, and I eventually became a part of his organization, and when I left Prairie View, uh, I came here to, to found and did found, uh, found, uh, found uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is still in operation in Kansas City today. I ask that question because there's, it all comes back to how it happened. Now, you served on the Kansas City uh, City Council for 12 years. How did that prepare you to become the first African-American mayor in 1991? Uh, it, it was the training ground, there's no question about it. Um, Bruce Watkins ran for, was, was going to run for mayor, and he, take, he took me downtown Kansas City to Myron Greens. Uh, anybody here been around? My, it, uh, it's not even here anymore. So he took me to, to Myron Greens for lunch, and uh, I'm sitting down and he says, because he's on, he's on the city council, and he says, I want you to run for uh, my seat. I'm going to run for mayor. And I said, well, I'm just getting started. You know, my congregation needs a lot more attention. And Bruce could turn on the tears like people turn on the faucet in their kitchen. And, uh, and so he's, you know, tears are coming down. He said, we really needed you to run. And this is, 
So people are looking at me like, you know, what is he doing that old man, talking to that old man like that? So, so I'm, you know, you know, like whatever, what do you want me to do? So I, I agreed to run for the city council and Bruce ran for mayor, uh, lost, found out uh, six months after the election that he had brain cancer and, and died a short time uh, afterward. But my time on the city council was, was good. I learned a lot, I met a lot of people. Uh, Dick Berkeley um, was mayor for three years, for three terms. We'll never have uh, another three-term mayor. Very popular, he could have probably won a fourth term when I ran. But Dick Berkeley um, helped me become mayor and I think everybody knew it and everybody knows it today and I uh, say it uh, everywhere and anywhere and, and, and I mean, he's a remarkable man. He's the former uh, state Republican chairman from Missouri. Okay. And he groomed me, a young black Democrat, to be the mayor. And he and his wife were there uh, at the hotel that night uh, when, the, uh, when Channel 9 first announced that I had won the election. Uh, and uh, he, is, he and I are still friends. Uh, uh, my wife, Diane, and, and uh, the, the Berkeleys, Sandy and Dick Berkeley, friends. And when we started developing the riverfront, I t my wife and I took them to uh, the Berkeleys to dinner at JJ's. And I said, uh, Dick, uh, I would like to name the park that we're building down on the riverfront, the Richard L. Berkeley Park. And of course, he was emotional and, and, and gave me permission to do it. And today, uh, that is the Richard L. Berkeley Park on the River. You are an ordained, ordained minister. St. James United Methodist Church, a very large, over 2,000 membership. And I also read that your son, Emmanuel Cleaver III, is a senior pastor. Okay. Now, how does being an ordained minister help you to deal with all the different kinds of issues and people that you must encounter? Well, first, uh, I think so many people have a misconception about, I mean, I have, I've had people ask me over the years, well, now, uh, what about this mixing politics and religion? And my uh, answer is usually, well, what, what, what do you mean mixing? How, how do you do it? Do you stir it? Do you, you know, break it in little pieces? I mean, how, here's, here's the thing. Uh, in politics, at least up until recently, um, a person's religion uh, could influence him or her uh, in, in the way they voted, but it was nothing that people announced. You know, I'm getting ready to vote on this because I believe that Matthew 6, 12 says, you know, that's, that has not been the history in the United States. Um, but theologically, I, I mean, I, uh, you know, the, the there are very few things that come up that are, are, are actually theological or biblical. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, what, how, how do, does God want you to pave this street on, for four blocks or for six? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, does God prefer, uh, you know, uh, the things I put up on Bartle the, that everybody went crazy over uh, about? I mean, does God like, you know, the sky stations, which is what they were called. I mean, it, it, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Um, I ran into a, a problem with, the, with gaming. When I, came, when I was mayor, I, I, you know, folk come in one, uh, walked in one day and said, we'd like to have riverboat gaming. The Methodist Church, in its social principles, uh, does not support gaming. Uh, we, the, the church's position is that it uses our best to create our worst. So we don't, we don't support it. But when I ran for mayor, I didn't run uh, for mayor uh, for as pastor of Kansas City. So if I'm going to now try to sprinkle Methodist principles, social principles, into municipal policy, then I should have run on that. I should have told the people, if you elect me mayor, I will implement Methodist social principles. I didn't do that. So um, I told the Hilton people, all, all the riverboat entities, I said, look, you know, uh, I don't gamble. 
I don't gamble here, I don't gamble when I'm in Las Vegas, I don't gamble on boats, I don't, I've never had enough money to gamble, I don't, I don't do it, uh, but I'm not gonna try to, to hurt you. If the council approves this, I will sign it. Uh, the ministers got together and said, we're gonna fight this, uh, help yourself. Um, as some of you may remember, the first le election, it was overwhelmingly voted uh, approval for riverboat gaming. The minister said, we gotta work harder. So they took, did a petition, had another election. I said, guys, when you go to church on Sunday morning and tell the people uh, to vote against gaming on Tuesday, they're all gonna say, yes, Reverend, amen, amen, and go on right out and vote for it. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, the, the non-church community couldn't have put that in uh, by themselves. Um, and, and so on, on the groundbreaking, I had a separate groundbreaking for just me, my security uh, detail, uh, the president of the Hilton boat, we went down, they took a picture, uh, nobody else was around. And then they had a big grand opening later that evening. Uh, I, I learned a lot in the church about politics, um, uh, particularly in the Methodist church. We, we, there are two connectional churches the Catholic Church and the Methodist, where, where you have a real episcopacy. It's not one of those deals where the pastor wakes up one morning and says, I think I want to be a bishop. And, uh, and, then just, and then by nightfall, uh, he's, a, he's a bishop. Uh, and and, and I'm, should I not say it there? So, uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an episcopal system, so you, there is politics there. Every uh, quadrennial, we elect bishops and, and uh, you know, you, you, you learn the politics of the church uh, and you learn, if you really learn it, you can function anywhere. All right, I have a few more questions and I'm gonna go quicker because I think our time is getting away. But during your eight years in the office of the mayor, you distinguished yourself as an economic development activist and a redevelopment craftsman. Give me one example of what you think was your major accomplish accomplishment as mayor. Uh oh. Oh, I know it's several. Well, Go ahead. The, uh, well, the, Run the list. The, when, when I left office, the news media was asking me my greatest accomplishment. When I told them, they just went right by it, and I knew they weren't going to write about it. But my greatest, ex my greatest uh, uh, success is that nothing happened. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, we had opportunity for some bad stuff to happen. The night that the Rodney King decision uh, was reached, we had riding all over the country. Uh, we had a gathering of African Americans uh, down on Brush Creek. Uh, we were able to, to uh, when I found out about it, I was called by Carol Coe. She said, you need to get down here. There are about 400 people that get ready to march to the plaza and other people are gonna join the way. Anyway, I, I get over there quickly, we, get, we disperse it. Uh, Reverend Nelson Thompson, uh, I spoke, he stood up, he said, look, we're gonna embarrass the mayor, you know, let's, let's go home. And that, so uh, uh, it didn't happen. I, I spent the evening walking around down in Westport uh, with my security and, and talking to um, to people trying to make sure we didn't have anything. So nothing happened. But nobody likes to write about things that didn't happen. So uh, n nobody would ever uh, look at that. Uh, I, I think, you know, they would look at Brush Creek and, and uh, probably the younger people don't even remember how it used to look. Uh, but, uh, I, I, you know, that's a $120 million project. Uh, and, uh, or Bartle Hall, uh, um, New American Royal, 18th and Vine, Union Station. We were able to bring Harley Davidson to town. Uh, there were 80 cities trying to get the, the plant. We, we were able to get it, uh, get the plant here. We brought uh, Transamerica from California to the AT&T town pavilion. I don't know what, what uh, you know, uh, what, probably the, the greatest thing was uh, uh, getting Marcus Allen, um, I think, yeah, getting Marcus Allen here in, in, uh, for, the, for the Chiefs and uh, Joe Montana at the same time. <laughs> and, uh, no other mayor uh, had that. All right. You represent the fifth uh, congressional district and you're in your fourth term. And actually that is the home district of President Harry Truman. And I think a lot of people may not know that. But how has Congress changed since you were elected almost eight years ago? It was horrible before I was elected, and now it's horrible, horrible alert. 
it's, it, it, is a, um, it is a tragic uh, case, I think, of uh, what's happening across the length and breadth of our country. Uh, when I got there, I was told before I got there, they said, now, you've got to understand, uh, some people are not going to speak to you. And I said, for, for what? They said, you know, you, you have a D uh, behind your name. And, uh, and, and the first time I experienced it, I thought, this is, this is maddening. Of course, there were Democrats who wouldn't speak to people with the R behind their name as well. I mean, it's just, it was terrible. And uh, it has become terrible <laughs> uh, over the years. And uh, the public is responsible. How is the public responsible? Uh, because the public is schizophrenic. What, they, what the public does is it say, they say, we hate all of this nasty campaigning. But then they'd watch it on TV, make a decision based on what they see, and then they send somebody to Congress who was nasty in the campaign, and they believe somehow that some kind of metamorphosis will occur, and they will get in Congress and be nice. They're going to do in Congress what they did in the campaign. And they come to Congress angry because of the campaign. And um, it's, it's a, it's, it, so every year we become more and more polarized because people, um, uh, you know, are demanding polarization. Uh, I, I, I went to a Democratic club um, when I was running the first time for Congress, and uh, Phil Scaglia was with me. And a woman walked up to me and said, uh, we're not going to support you because you, were, you went to Kit Bond's wedding. And uh, I'm not making this up. And, uh, and, and of course, Kit Bond has, has also had the same kind of thing uh, thrown at him. Uh, Kit and Linda uh, Bond are good friends of mine. Uh, uh, I did something for him when he retired that people in Washington thought was crazy. I gave him a going away dinner. I, I sponsored it and paid for it. Uh, when I was elected, he gave a reception for me. You don't give receptions for people in the other party. Uh, we, we like each other. We've traveled together. But the new world that we've created here is hostility. And if you're a Republican, you're supposed to dislike Democrats. And if you're a Democrat, you're supposed to dislike Republicans. And uh, it's getting worse and worse, and every year, we, as I, I said, more and more people are elected uh, along the, the lines of polarization. So uh, the public is getting exactly what they, they sent to Washington, people mm -hmm. who don't like each other. All right. You were elected uh, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, and what do we have, 43 members all total. What are your responsibilities for uh, being chair? To go crazy. To go crazy. Yes. And they're working on it every day. Uh, to, uh, uh, it, it is, it, it is, you, you, you can answer this question yourself based on your own work, but uh, I, I, have, I have 42 prima donnas. All of them are, are good people. God loves them. They take care of their children and so forth. But, uh, uh, you know the the awesomeness of the responsibility is is uh, just unbelievable because um, uh, any problem that crops up, um, you know somehow I've got to deal with it. Um, I got a an email from well my chief of staff got an email the chief, CBC chief chief, uh, chief of chief of staff received an email from John Boehner's chief of staff saying Maxine Waters had just called him and, and uh, Cantor some name, uh, you know, uh, and uh, of course I'm not in charge of all black people, but, um, <laughs> I, you know, I end up having to, to deal with, I mean, you name it, I deal with it. Capitol Police, uh, they are, you know, they feel like they're not getting promoted, uh, commensurate with their time and skills. Uh, every member wants me to come speak in their district, in their congressional district. I'm in Georgia. I preach in Alban Albany, Georgia, this past Sunday morning. And then Monday morning at 7, I'm speaking um, 
in uh, Columbus, Georgia at a breakfast. Uh, and if I could say yes, I would never come home if I said yes to all of the, the, the requests. And then, of course, uh, you know, we, we have a, meet, uh, a meeting every Wednesday. Uh, we, uh, we put together a budget every year. Uh, we, we, we broke it off and started a, a, a foundation, uh, with, uh, educational foundation. Uh, so we do a lot of research. Uh, and we uh, uh, actually try to support uh, uh, each other and it is a, uh, a job that, frankly, I'm, I, I never imagined, I never imagined I was going to run for Congress, but I certainly never imagined I would be the, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, and I never ran for it in, uh, in, in the sense that I go out, went out and said, I, I want to be the chair. Um, I was kind of, you know, selected and uh, nominated. Somebody said I moved for acclamation, and I, I was in, ended up as, as the chair. But um, we, we, we have a potpourri of, of issues today. I mentioned uh, Dick Gregory coming to my office. He's bringing some folk. He, he brought 300,000 names of, uh, of black people who live on the Gulf uh, who um, have not been uh, compensated for, for all of their losses by BP. And so, you know, the request is we need you to get involved in this. And it goes on and on. We don't have enough time tonight or this week. Good. Well, let me, me jump in and say, what's your relationship as the CBC, which is a Congressional Black Caucus, with President Obama? Because, I mean, like, I mean, do you do what he wants you to do? Or how does that work with the president? I do what Diane Cleaver wants me to do. And then, <laughs> and, and, uh, and so <laughs> Obama, at best, is second. Uh, but um, uh, no, we 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 disagree. Uh, the 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 mark of sophisticated uh, and mature politics is the ability to disagree uh, without demonizing. Uh, and we we we're going to disagree with the president. Uh, the Congressional Black Caucus has disagreed with every president since Richard Nixon. And to say that we're not going to have disagreements with, with President Obama is sick. I mean, it, 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 it makes no sense. It, it means we uh, are not going to be what we uh, said we were going to be when we were founded. So yeah, there, there are instances uh, where we've had disagreements. I've been in the White House with the President, and he said to me, he said, uh, for example, uh, community development block grants. He mm -hmm. said, I'm going to have to do a 10% cut on uh, community development block grants. He said, now, now I know you've got to go out and say what you have to say. Mm -hmm. He said, you, sure, you were right about that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to let the people in my congressional district believe that I, I'm OK with that. Now, I understand why the president you know, did that. But, but, but yes, we're going to disagree with him, and we have disagreed with him. But um, it, it, the disagreement is not, going, is not going to be nasty. OK. Now, I read that you supported during the election, Hillary Clinton. Oh, my Lord. Oh, yeah. And uh, President Obama and some people were criticized you for doing that because how could you go against another black person that was running for office? Uh, what would you say about that? Um, I, I would say that it, it, it's, it's a sick nation uh, that, we, that we forget ethics and, and morality. Um, if I'm driving in a two-seater down the street with um, a white friend of mine uh, whom I've known for years and years, and I see a black man hitchhiking, and I say to my friend who, whom I've known for 25 years who's white, hey, I'm sorry, you got to get out. Uh, there's a brother <laughs> over here. <laughs> now, it's true, I don't know him, <laughs> but he's my brother, so you get out. Uh, I've known the, the Clintons for 25 years, um, and uh, did I would, would I did I want a black president? Uh, anybody who says they didn't is lying. Uh, but I didn't know uh, Senator Obama. I didn't know him, and nobody in here did either. Uh, you know, you just didn't. I mean that, uh, uh, and so uh, for me to go to to uh, Senator. 
Clinton, whom I've known for years, and said, and, and said I'm sorry, I can't uh, support you. Well, why? Well, the uh, guy's run over here. Well, well, do you know him? I well, know, but he's black. That's, that's, that's silly. And I, I, I would like to believe I'm a better person than that. Uh, and so it didn't matter that somebody criticized me. I, I slept well every night. And the one thing that it, it, it showed the president, not, that I, I think, was, you know, this guy's for you, he's for you. And so uh, last week, uh, the president uh, calls and says, I want you to be one of my co-chairs for my uh, re-election campaign. Because he knows if I'm going to be for him, there's no tricks, there's no playing with somebody else, footsie, uh, on, on another ticket, I'm going to be for you. Uh, and that's, that's, and that's, you know, I, I, I'd like to believe that my parents and grandparents, and I'd like to believe that my children would think that that's the right thing to do. Okay. In 2009, many have said you introduced the most ambitious project of your political career, the creation of a green impact zone. Please tell us about this successful project. When I, I made a, a mistake when I created something called the Public Improvement Advisory Committee when I was mayor. And, and we had a sales tax election. We raised $25, $25 million a year, and we divided it by six, six council districts. Mm -hmm. um, I did it again with something called the Neighborhood Tourism Fund. We divided the money that came in by six. When you divide by six, it, it prevents you from concentrating on uh, areas that need uh, desperate repair. Um, when when uh, the story is told by my grandpa, about my grandpa that people would ask him, uh, you've got 18 kids, uh, do you have a favorite? And he would always say, yes. And of course that would pique people's attention. Uh, now which one is your favorite? And he'd say, my favorite child is the one who was sick or hurt, or frustrated, or down and out. Now when he or she gets better, we're back even. And that's how I feel about communities. Um, the community that, that should receive the greatest resources are those uh, that are hurt, that are wounded, that are down and out. And so when the stimulus was approved, I said, look, we're going to pick 150 blocks in the worst part of Kansas City's urban core. The Kansas City Star had done a, a series of articles calling this area the murder factory. That's right. And so we put money in there. We're doing smart grid technology where somebody can sit here tonight uh, and with that telephone reduce the, lower the, temp, the, the thermostat uh, so that uh, they don't use more energy. They can measure their energy intake uh, at all times. Uh, we have uh, solar panels on top of Paseo High School in the, in the area. We have, we're doing weatherization in the homes. We're also creating a whole new profession, weatherization experts, uh, people who were unemployed in this area. And in some parts of this area, we had unemployment at 57% before the recession. And so uh, we're training people uh, to uh, do weatherization. Uh, we're also training people to do deconstruction we're the only nation on the planet that uh, decides to, uh, we need uh, some expansion. We just tear down everything in, in the pathway uh, around the world. They have buildings uh, that are three, four hundred, uh, five hundred years old. And so we, we're, what we're doing is things that have to come down, we're deconstructing them so we can save the materials to be used again. And uh, uh, that's going to be a new profession as we go further into the 21st century. Uh, uh, Wells Fargo donated uh, 21 homes in the Green Impact Zone that were foreclosed. We, we go in and do neighborhood stabilization. We rehab them. Uh, we warehouse them for right now, and then when the economy breaks, we will be able to, uh, uh, to sell them uh, at, a, at a, a reduced cost. We hired 1,200 uh, young people uh, to go out and do uh, all kinds of things in homes that they could do, I mean, for example, most people, the, the, the toilet runs and, you know, they don't think much about it. They hit the little, the, the handle and it stops and so they leave it alone. Uh, but that, 
uses an enormous amount of water. So kids were trained to, to repair that in homes in the green uh, impact zone to help people build clotheslines uh, uh, out in the, the yards. Uh, and then we, we received a Tiger grant, so we're, we're building curves and sidewalks, and they are uh, uh, curves and sidewalks that are, that are green, uh, pervious, where uh, the water won't settle on the, on, on the concrete. It, it actually goes off and we can create bioretention centers. Um, and, and so there's no other place in the country, in the world, where all of this is being done. Uh, and and uh, and uh, yes, just yesterday before yesterday, make it right. Brad Pitt's organization um, and joined with us, and we announced uh, that we're rebuilding uh, a, a one of the Kansas City, Missouri schools that was closed down, Bancroft School. We're going to create senior citizen condos there. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, four boarded up houses next to it. You can't um, you can't expect that neighborhood to come back. Uh, if we continue to do that. So we're, we're, we're rebuilding the, the urban core, and we have some announcements that are still going to be made about additional things. That is exciting. When we start talking about everything else, you never think it's in terms of the congressman working on the green projects, and I think that is really valuable. I have one more question, and then we'll open it up to you for your questions. Part of our mission here at the Dole Institute of Politics is to help our students get involved, and especially in civic engagement and public service. So I would just ask you to address the students that are here this evening of why they should become involved in public service, why they should become more engaged um, for their own communities, but for themselves as well. Well, because they can't leave change to old people. And, uh, <laughs> and the history of this, of this planet uh, is a history of young people making things happen. Uh, whether it was a 22-year-old Alexander the Great, uh, or whether it was a 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, 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 one of my, I, when I speak to, uh, to college groups, I tell them uh, th that you know, when I was in school, uh, my, my uh, uh, generation stopped a war, stopped it, uh, the war in Vietnam. Uh, and we, although we were idealistic to the point of being ridiculous, but we assumed that we were going to stop, not only stop the war, we were going to stop racism, and we were going to, uh, you know, stop uh, the devaluation of the environment. I mean, we, all these idealistic things. Um, and and I, I think that uh, when you are young uh, and energetic, and smart as are many of our young people in colleges and universities all over this country, uh, there is no limit to what they can do to change uh, this nation for the better. And, and in fact, if they don't do it, it probably won't get done. Uh, it's either their generation in charge uh, of making the changes or the change is not gonna happen. Well, I want you all to know how excited I was this evening to have the opportunity to interview our congressman. Now it's your turn to ask your question. I see one in front. Emmanuel, I think one of the most important things you said tonight was when you talked about how the CDC can disagree without demonizing. When you said that, it tells me that it can be done. So if it can be done, what do we need to do as citizens to help grow that, to help combat all of the antagonism that is starting to ruin politics and I think can ruin the country if we don't get a handle on this? How can we affect that to make it grow? Well, you know, I've been advocating for years that we need to have uh, some kind of think tank that only deals with civility. And uh, th th before e each election, there ought to be a report card uh, that deals with the, the members of Congress. There's a report card on everything, for those of you who are not really involved in politics. There's a report card on, on your votes on the environment, uh, on labor issues, on whatever. Uh, there's n there are no report cards given on civility. 
and, uh, and, and so, and then the public has got to be able to put uh, partisanship aside and say, I don't care if it's a Democrat or a Republican. If they are going to go to Washington for antagonism, I don't want them there, and I'm not going to vote for them. Now, most Americans, even if they don't like the, 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 uh, the acrimony, they're still going to vote the party because, you know, I don't like it, but, you know, I'm not going to vote for the other people. And as long as we, uh, as long as we continue to do that, it, it's not going to stop. I, I'm a, I, I, I'm an atom, uh, animal person. My family will tell you. I, I mean, my favorite channel is is uh, uh, Animal uh, Channel, Discovery Channel. Um, I, uh, I mean, there's there's no movie that that that's ever been made that's better than a movie about lions, and uh, or, or crocs, uh, but. Uh, I, I, because I'm, I'm so into animals, I've learned so much. And one of the things I learned in watching a, a series on bees, there's some, there's some, there's some br brilliant creatures, uh, but that bees cannot sting and make honey at the same time. And they make a choice because if you, a, a bee, once the bee stings you, uh, he's sacrificing his life because uh, the stinger w will remain in you, and it li and it wounds the bee. It's a mortal wound because uh, part of his anatomy is gone, and so they they die shortly. Uh, so you have to make a decision: Are we going to make honey or are we going to make war? You can't do both at the same time. And one of the reasons we're not solving problems related to Im immigration, uh, we're not creating jobs. Um, we're not doing um, much in the way of energy policy is because we're stinging. Now you probably think that Democrats and Republicans are sitting around in Washington at some table talking about immigration and the great issues facing the country and you would be absolutely wrong. That does not happen. And uh, uh, Shelley Moore Capito, a Republican from West Virginia and I, well, she's a, a sweetheart, one of my good friends, she and I started the Civility Caucus. Uh, I think we have 23 members. There are 196 members of the Wine Caucus. Uh, so, you, hey, you can go look it up when you get home. Go to your computers. You can, uh, you know. So I, I, I think everybody knows that that's why we're not getting anything done because of the, the, the acrimony, uh, and the public supports it. Listen, look at this. Uh, Somebody yells out at the, um, during the State of the Union speech, you lie. First time it's ever happened in the history of the Republic. So what does the public do to that person? They allow him to raise $1.6 million in two weeks for his campaign. So he's learned his lesson. Another question. I've appreciated what you shared with us so far, but I've often wondered one thing. I was born and raised in Kansas City, Kansas. I've often wondered what the citizenship and the leadership of Kansas City, Missouri view Kansas City, Kansas. You're a mean person. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, um, Uh, the mayor um, of, of Kansas City, Kansas, uh, Steininger, um, Joe Steininger and I got along well. Um, you know, I've, I've, got, I've worked well with the mayors uh, over in KCK uh, for years and, and the ministers. Um, I, you know, um, we don't do a lot together. Uh, we've had conflict with the police when I was mayor. We, you know, uh, we had problems with the we had to clamp down on KCK police officers chasing uh, people into Missouri because uh, they would shoot. Uh, we, we had a much more restrictive shooting policy. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, it's, it's just different. I, I mean, it's not bad or good. It's, it's, it's different. It's a, I mean, I know it's amazing just cross that river and, uh, and it changes. It's, and um, I, 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 I can't explain it. Um, uh, 
and I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have another question? Uh, tonight you seem, you really seem to be civil tonight. You seem to answer one of my questions, which has to do with uh, Barack Obama and say the D after his title, because I've always felt that way back when he was elected, that the conservatives said, we don't want a black person in, in the White House, and we'll do everything we can to stop him, to make him a one-term president. And they have done that in Congress, like rejecting all, everything he's done. But do you think it's because of the D, or is it because he's a black man? Well, I, it's probably because of both, but uh, that, make no mistake, anybody, look, look uh, his blackness has been a, an issue, and there's no question about it. I have one of my colleagues in uh, Colorado that just called him Sambo, um, and apologize, of course they all, you know, apologize after they do it, uh, and, and we, there's a whole litany of stuff, of, of, of things that just members of Congress have done. Um, I think there are legitimate reasons to disagree with the president. And, and, and there are people of, of goodwill who are Republican who disagree politically with, with some of the things that he's done. And they, and they have a right to. I disagree with him on, 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 on some things. Um, uh, there is a, I, I, I was thinking about this coming down here. The Bob Dole Republicans, there are very few of them in Congress now. I mean, Bob Dole, we, the reason we have a, a, a Martin Luther King holiday is Bob Dole. Bob Dole is the one who went to, Richard, went to uh, President Reagan, who was not going to sign it, and insisted on him doing it. The, 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 the way things are happening now is that uh, the president is getting some heat because he is black, and uh, the president's done everything he could conceivably do far more than I would like to, for him to have done to, to, to uh, you know, convince the country that, that he's not black, uh, you know, and, 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 but in spite of that, it doesn't matter. There is some resistance, and some of that is in Congress. Um, you know, uh, we, we have, We've, we've come a long way. I mean, my congressional district, I'm elected from a 17% black congressional district. I'm sorry uh, that uh, most people have assumed that if you see a black member of Congress, it was from a black district. Uh, but 17%, and, and I've been elected uh, uh, four times. Uh, so we've changed, but, but never should we trick ourselves into believing that that's universal. <laughs> Uh, there's some stuff out here that's that's, that's ugly, uh, and and they they uh, are you know now uh, uh, Friday being CBC chair, okay. I'm sitting in my office not bothering anybody. Uh, all of a sudden, somebody comes in and says a a radio talk show host just called Maxine Waters a black whore on the air. Um, I said, well, you know, uh, did they fire him? No. Did they suspend him? No. Uh, so I have to make a decision. Do we, do we wage a battle w with this guy, you know, for six or seven weeks to get them to the station to suspend him or something? Or do we say, look, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. We're going to leave it alone. We chose to, I chose, you know, to, to, to leave it alone. We can't fight every one of those battles. And we get some kind of name calling on the president, you know, uh, every 15 seconds. Uh, just look we at might the- might tell him who Maxine Waters is. Maxine, I'm sorry, Maxine Waters uh, is a, a congresswoman from Los Angeles. Not from a black district. Not from a black district. Most people uh, believe otherwise. But anyway, um, it, we, we've got some race problems. We, you know, it's, it's simple, we, we got them. And everybody knows it. Uh, you know, but I mean, we and, and I don't. I don't think we we're going to be able to deal with it until we admit it and work on it. And uh, we don't want to to admit it right now. It's, okay. We want to say it's, you know, we're we're a post-racial society, and we're not. You know, I would I would hope that my children and my grandchildren uh, will will enjoy that that world. And uh, and I think unless we tear it apart 
politically they have a chance. But uh, you know, uh, people making these kind of statements are not uh, are essentially doing it with impunity now. Okay, question right there. Did your Green Impact Zone initiatives help attract Google's investments in Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri? Uh, one, of the, one of the things that helped attract Google was the Green Impact Zone, and there's, there, there is still uh, some uh, great possibilities of things that, that, that will happen in the Green Impact Zone as, as, as a result of, of Google coming uh, to this area. Uh, it's one of the best things that's happened. It's a really big deal much bigger than people think. And, uh, and, and they'll come to realize it as, as, as projects are announced and, uh, and, and, and they get a chance to see what's going on now. In the poor neighborhoods, people don't have computers and they're not going online. And, and so it may give us an opportunity to, to do some things in the poor neighborhoods that will make this an advanced city. And, it, and if we can do that, it, it helps to attract major uh, employers. Uh, one of the things that hurts our community is, if, for example, Harley Davidson. One of the things they argued about when they, when when we first made an approach to, uh, to get them to come here was, your, your workforce is not capable and competent, and and so uh, I think with with Google's arrival, we we have the opportunity to develop a more sophisticated workforce uh, that would attract major corporations just like that. Okay, I see a question, a student question there. Um, going back to race and Obama, I was just curious, um, so do you not think that Obama helped at all with the racial problems in America or like, I mean, his image within itself, you know, I'm just curious how you felt about Obama and if he's helping or hurting the racial problem in America? Well, I mean, uh, Obama is trying to be the president and uh, if he could do it the way he wanted, uh, it would be uh, so that nobody would have to discuss his race. Uh, the fact that we're discussing his race answers your question. You, you understand what I'm saying? You with me? Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, it, it, you know, it helps and it hurts. Because the, the, the hurt part is that it, ha it, it has given um, some strength uh, uh, and energy to, to, to the people who, who, who are still making decisions based on race. And so, you know, it, it, it appears as if, you know, there's more racism now than it was three years ago. I don't think that's the case. I think it's just more uh, on the surface now. Uh, you know, no, people are not talking about it. You and, you and I might talk about it, but uh, don't fool yourself if you think that uh, people around this country are having serious uh, and, and intimate conversations about race. We do need to do that, uh, but we don't. And, um, I, I, and it's because people are, uh, are awkward. Uh, they don't, they, you know, they don't, you know, they don't know what, what to say and what not to say. And so as a result, they just say nothing. I'll take two more questions, and I see one back there. Whichever, wherever you want to go. Hi, I'd like to uh, follow up on the uh, comment you had earlier, Congressman, about having some sort of civility think tank that would issue a report card. Um, what concerns me about an idea like that is the second that somebody on a radio show or on a blog hears something they don't like, and um, throws out an accusation of bias. Does that damage and any sort of? Um, was an ac I'm sorry, a an accusation. <clears throat> I missed um, what you said. I'm sorry. Oh, um, if there were a civility uh, think tank that would issue a report card with every campaign, um, the danger that I worry about is somebody hearing a result they don't like, perhaps about a candidate they support. And then we start getting um, accusations of bias or this uh, think tank isn't doing its job right. Um, do you believe that's a real danger? And if it is, do you think we could overcome it? Well, it, it's, not more, it's not as dangerous as what's happening in Washington now. 
um, I, I, I do think that we ought to, the, the public ought to know and have the opportunity to make decisions based on uh, how a member of Congress conducts him or herself uh, during the course of their time in, 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 the, in that august body. When I was elected to Congress, I, I you know, almost weeped my first day uh, when I had a chance to go and stand in the well of the House of Representatives where the great orators stood and waxed eloquent. I thought, my goodness, I'm going to be able to stand there. And then I started seeing people coming in there, calling people names, uh, you know, uh, ranting, uh, you know, uh, uh, each day. And I thought, what is going on here? I, you know, um, and I, I think the public needs to know. Uh, most of the people are not going to watch C-SPAN. I don't blame you. If you do, you have a really bad life. Uh, if you're going to, uh, so uh, you know, we we need somebody who can provide information about people who are nasty. I mean, how many people knew about the guy uh, calling the president Sambo? See, that's the point I'm making. And so uh, you know, it, it needs to it, some organization, some institution ought to be, make it their business to make sure that the voting public understands. Now, the public may choose, as I painfully believe in, in many cases, to say, I don't like it, but I'm not going to vote for a person in the other party, no matter what. I'm uh, of the demographic that you said needs to change uh, Washington and all that's going down, and uh, that's quite daunting, especially when I discuss with my peers um, about politics, and they're immediately turned off, and they say, oh, all that's going on in Washington, it just, we can't change that, that just turns me off from politics, so um, it's like the chicken comes before the egg. Uh, what should we look to? How should we change this uh, culture of politics? Uh, in your time, you had Martin Luther King and charged leaders uh, who were speaking for your generation. Uh, who should we look to? What should we look for? Well, the, f first of all, um, the, the, the generation, your generation, is far, far more powerful than you, than you think. Um, and and all you have to do is look, look at the movements that, that took place, um, you know, in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, as I mentioned, these were young people uh, who, 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 who did all of this stuff, all of this done by young people. And I think uh, I can understand the cynicism of some of the young people. Uh, I had a, a, a young woman to tell me, you know, how frustrated she was, you know, we, President Obama was running, you know, hope we're going to change Washington, and, and, uh, and it didn't change. Um, uh, and and, and I, say, I said uh, to her, uh, you know, you know uh, the, the first time you go to bat, you may not hit a home run. That's no reason to quit playing baseball. Uh, you, you, we have to continue to push uh, for change. And, uh, you know, young people could, could carry this message. See, the problem, when, when the election was over, all of the young people who had, who had organized and gotten involved dispersed. It was over. We've achieved our goal. Let's go back uh, and forget it. And, and that's not the way it's going to happen. It's got to be a, a, a concerted effort, an ongoing effort to, to make changes and to demand change, to demand change. Uh, you know. Uh, I remember uh, before I ran for the city council, uh, some students at St. Paul School of Theology, young people who had just graduated from college and, and, and went to seminary, said, you know, it's a shame we don't have any uh, Latinos uh, on the uh, city council. And they got out and worked for a guy named Bobby Hernandez and got him elected in an area of the, where the, the minority population uh, 8% Al, I don't, 10% maybe, something like that. And he, he was elected. Uh, young people, and he's running against uh, a, a, a prominent attorney, Sal Capra, and he beat him, who had already been on the council for like two or three terms. And, uh, but, but it's, it's, you know, we're, we're talking about Freedom Incorporated. 
uh, those were young people that started Freedom Incorporated. Uh, and people in their 20s and 30s uh, that did that. I mean, you, you can't name hardly anything that young people didn't start. That old people messed up. <laughs> and so, I, you know, you're gonna have to uh, just, you know, you know ha have, have a vision uh, and go out and, and work to bring it into fruition and, and, and be as ridiculous as you want. I mean, in, in terms of believing what, what, what this nation can, can become. Um, because, that, you know, when we give that up, uh, then, then I, I think this nation that has survived for over 200 years uh, is, is, you know, in, in some jeopardy. I know there's, there's some political science professors here, and I, I'm always interested in finding out from them how they feel uh, about uh, Edward Gibbon's The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1 and 2, which we had to read in seminary. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, if we don't, if, if you don't do anything, this is going to continue. If you do something, it might stop. And let's make that the last word this evening. So give him a round of applause for everything. Thank you.